Well, y'all, this is a, a very informative briefing. I know some of you have been briefed a little bit before, but we'll go through it uh, for everyone. Uh, thank Lieutenant Governor Evett for being with, with me today for this. Uh, this is about our, our budget. Everywhere you look, South Carolina is growing. Our economy is booming. More and more people are visiting our state, and many deciding to stay here for good. Employers are creating new jobs all over the state. Entrepreneurs are opening new businesses, and companies are deciding to relocate or locate here. Our business and family-friendly environment has produced historic gains in new jobs, capital investment, and population growth. In 2021, we announced $4.3 billion in capital investment in the state, and with that, 15,000 new jobs from those investments. As of November 2021, there were 18,000 more South Carolinians employed than there were in February 2020. The state's gross domestic product increased by 10% during the COVID-19 pandemic and has increased 26% over the last five years, which is good news. The state's unemployment rate remains well below the national average and has improved in every month of 2021, dropping for five, from 5.6% 5 in November 2020 to 3.7% in November 2021. The 2020 U.S. Census data data shows that South Carolina is the 10th fastest growing state in the country. During the COVID-9 pandemic, as you know, many other states shuttered their economies, closed businesses, and enacted draconian restrictions, many of which still continue to this very day. Here in South Carolina, we took a better approach, a smarter approach. We never closed through our reasonable steps of limited, measured, and temporary actions, we've been able to combat the virus without crippling the economy. Also, by being careful and conservative and freezing new spending in 2020, not only did we avoid cutting services, raising taxes, or borrowing money, we saw our state's booming economy create a large amount of new surplus revenues in 2020. Some companies actually had their best years in their history here. Today, South Carolina's state government is the strongest fiscal condition in memory. We have the largest budget surplus, the largest rainy day reserve account balance, and the lowest debt in our lifetimes. Compare this to other states, for example, New York, where 476,000 fewer people are employed now than in February of 2020, and the state unemployment rate remains well above the national average and 2.7% higher than it was in February 2020. However, looking at this news, we still cannot be complacent. We know that the competition for jobs and investment is fierce, both nationally and globally, and especially in the Southeast. We know that South Carolina must have the workforce, the infrastructure, the intellectual capital, the environmental assets, and the quality of life necessary to compete, win, and achieve maximum prosperity for our people. The $2.4 billion in ARPA funds, along with the almost $3 billion in surplus revenue generated by South Carolina's booming economy, which I mentioned, presents us with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we cannot afford to squander. If we take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity by making big, bold, and transformative investments in the areas of education, infrastructure, and workforce, and economic development, South Carolina will prosper for generations to come. As you're aware, the Accelerate SC Task Force has played a vital role in our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The task force is comprised of volunteers from virtually every sector of our state's economy, along with officials from state, county, and local agencies and organizations, private organizations. I believe that Accelerate SC has become 
the model for collaboration, cooperation, and communication between the government and private sector for the rest of the country to emulate. Almost two years ago, Accelerate SC Task Force produced official recommendations and guidelines that allowed us to take, as I mentioned, a very targeted and limited approach and measures to combat the spread of the virus without shutting down the state's economy. In addition, Accelerate SC conducted a thorough and complete review of the Federal Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, known as CARES, for the purpose of providing expenditure recommendations to me. Last year, the Accelerate SC Task Force conducted a similar review of South Carolina's share of the federal ARPA funds and made expenditure recommendations to me. For the purpose today, I will dis discuss my recommendations to the General Assembly for uh, use of the federal ARPA funds along with highlights from my 2020 executive budget. Our rainy day reserve fund. As you know, for the second year in a row, my executive budget places $500 million into our state's rainy day reserve fund. By saving this money instead of spending it, something that has served our state well last year and before, we will double the size of our reserves and will be prepared for any future economic uncertainties should they arise. I ask the General Assembly to consider maintaining a minimum balance in the rainy, rainy day reserve fund account equal to 10% of the total amount of funds available to be appropriated in any year in the General Appropriations Act. Income tax. As has been noted often, South Carolina has the highest personal income tax in the Southeast and the 12th highest in the nation, which is not, which is not good for attracting and supporting business. This is unacceptable as it makes South Carolina less competitive for new jobs and capital investments, especially with our neighboring states of Georgia and North Carolina, both of which have lowered their income tax well below South Carolina's 7% rate and they are talking about going even lower. This year marks the fourth year that my executive budget proposes a 1% rate reduction over five years for all personal income tax brackets, starting with an immediate $177 million cut. Roads and bridges. There's no infrastructure more in need of big, bold, and transformative one-time investments than our state's roads, bridges, highways, and interstates. Our booming economy and rock rapid popul population growth have outpaced the state's ability to keep up with improvements to our transportation infrastructure. Utilizing a combination of $660 million in federal ARPA funds and $600 million from surplus revenue available in the state budget, I am recommending that the General Assembly provide no less than $1.26 billion to the Department of Transportation to accelerate construction, expansion, or improvements to our state-owned roads, bridges, highways, and interstates. This is a one-time investment of over a billion dollars which will allow the South Carolina Department of Transportation to accelerate and start the completion of some of the highest priority projects in the state projects such as widening Interstate 26 to 6 lanes between Columbia and Charleston, the widening of Interstate 95 to 6 lanes in the low country, and additional lane widening on Interstate 85 in the upstate. In addition, in addition, with a recurring appropriation of $100 million of the $600 million included in my executive budget, the Department of Transportation will have sufficient state matching funds to apply for an additional $250 million in federal funds each year from the Federal Infrastructure and Jobs Act for the next five years. That's the one that just passed in November. These federal matching funds will allow the South Carolina Department of Transportation to expedite completion of local and regional projects designed to relieve traffic congestion, to repair or replace over 400 bridges and to enhance repaving and resurfacing 
of our local and secondary roads. Education. When the Education Finance Act of 1977 was signed into law and funded, there were only three line item appropriations to school districts for K-12 education. Today, school districts receive recurring general funds and EIA funds from approximately 29, that is 29 separate line item appropriations. They are difficult for the average citizen to understand and even difficult for some who deal in this area to understand. The 44-year-old funding system is archaic and complicated. It is piecemeal and must be transformed if our state is to meet the educational needs of our children. To achieve these objectives, the system by which we fund K-4 education must be simplified and must, be, and must focus on greater accountability. It must be understandable. It must be a system where the state funds follow students directly to the classroom. The system must also clearly hold districts, school districts, accountable for both how the state funds are spent and the results of the taxpayer's investment. My executive budget increases the state minimum teacher salary schedule by $2,000. Consequently, the minimum starting salary of a teacher in South Carolina will be increased from $36,000 to $38,000 a year. It's important to remember just five years ago, the minimum starting salary of a teacher in South Carolina was $30,113. In addition, this reform proposal provide state financial resources to support a state average student ratio, excuse me, student teacher ratio of 11.7 students per teacher with an average teacher salary, including fringe benefits of $66,524. In exchange, school districts must provide the Department of Education with, and the department must publish on its website an easy to understand dashboard documenting the expenditure of all funds, state, local, and federal, that support public schools to achieve the state's education objectives. This added layer of transparency will allow parents and taxpayers to know where, whether their money is being used by the district to educate children in the classroom on or on administrative or overhead costs or on anything else necessary or unnecessary. Charter schools in the state have seen explosive growth, as we know, in both enrollment and demand. My executive budget provides an additional $60.2 million, anticipating that there will be a total of 67 charter schools, old and new, authorized and operating by the South Carolina Public Charter School District and by institutions of higher education in the school year of 2022 and 2023. In addition, this executive budget provides $20 million in lottery dollars for the creation of education savings accounts, which will require a change in law by the General Assembly. These accounts provide the opportunity for working or lower income parents to choose the type of education environment and instruction that best suits their children's unique needs. Finally, school bus drivers are important. As we know, we must have competent, reliable school bus drivers as they are essential to our children's safety and education. The pandemic has exacerbated the shortage of school bus drivers. So to recruit and retain school bus drivers, I'm proposing that 12 million in non-recurring funds be appropriated to provide a one-time bonus of $2,000 for each school bus driver for the 22-23 school year. The $2,000 bonus should be paid in three separate payments awarded in August 2022, December 2022, and at the end of the school year in 2023. In addition, my executive budget allocates $24 million for the purchase of energy efficient school buses with low to zero emissions. Labor crisis. To address the historic labor crisis affecting key sectors of our economy, I'm requesting that the General Assembly invest $124 million in ARPA funds 
to expand the workforce scholarships for the future, a program existing now that allows students to earn an industry credential or associate degree in high demand careers like manufacturing, healthcare, computer science, information technology, transportation, logistics, or construction. We know that this will work. Last year, we partnered with the South Carolina Technical College System to create these scholarships and dedicated $29 million in the Federal Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds called GEAR Funds to start the program. To date, just to date with those funds, over 4,000 South Carolin Carolinians have been retrained and reemployed. These scholarships are what they call last dollar scholarships, meaning that the student must first exhaust all other financial or academic assistance available, like the federal Pell Grants. Recipients will be required to maintain a 2.0 grade point average to keep, keep the scholarship, and if unemployed, to either complete 100 hours of volunteer service or complete a financial literacy course offered at the technical college they're attending. Access to higher education for every South Carolinian is essential to ensure that our state has trained and skilled workforce to compete for jobs and investment in the future. The workforce is becoming more and more futuristic. It's more and more a knowledge economy, a high-tech economy. This means that we must invest to make all higher education, that is our colleges, four-year colleges, our universities, our technical colleges, make them all accessible and affordable for the sons and daughters of South Carolina. This executive budget marks the third consecutive year that I have proposed that the General Assembly freeze college tuition for in-state students with an appropriation of $20.1 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. This represents the 2.7% increase in the higher education price index for 2022 and is based on the number of in-state students enrolled at each public institution. Also, I <clears throat> provide I propose providing $600 million so that every South Carolinian who qualifies for federal needs-based financial aid as measured by the federal Pell Grants has sufficient state financial assistance to attend any in-state public college, university, or technical college. Students at private, independent, and historically black colleges and universities will receive an additional $20 million for tuition grants and assistance. We will need, meet in this way the needs of all of our students in South Carolina. As I recommended last year, we must continue to address the repairs needed at these schools, these aging state-owned buildings, and infrastructure on the campuses on, of our colleges, universities, and technical colleges. I ask the General Assembly to join me in paying down the state's deferred maintenance liability with available capital reserve funds to be distributed pro rata based on any, each institution's fall 2021 in-state enrollment rather than borrowing it and creating more debt in the future through a bond bill. This is for fixing the old buildings, not building new ones. Water and sewer. In rural South Carolina, water and sewer, as we know, <clears throat> is the key to life and prosperity. It's key to good public health, economic health, the community's health. The right water and sewer assets in a county can transform a tax base. That means jobs, good schools, strong families, and a safe and vibrant community. Many industries, businesses will not go to some of our particular rural areas because they do not have access to water and sewer. Our rural water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure is becoming old and outdated. According to the State Rural Infrastructure Authority, the average age of a water and sewer system in our state is 47 to 50 years old. Many of these systems have exceeded their useful life. I have proposed that the RIA administer $500 million in ARPA funds and prioritize the distribution of grants for grants 
for water, sewer, and stormwater to systems in the state's poorest counties, for water and wastewater systems that are currently operating out of compliance with regulations, and to incentivize large municipal water and sewer systems to connect their systems to the smaller and faltering systems. That brings us to broadband. <clears throat> we must be vigorous in broadband. In recent years, facilitating access to broadband connectivity has become a top priority for South Carolina. From health care to education and the increase in people working from home and everywhere else, quality internet service has quickly become a necessity for the prosperity of our state and people. In 2020, the General Assembly appropriated $50 million in CARES Act, that was in March of 2020 that that passed, funds for this purpose and placed the Office of Regulatory Staff in charge of directing and managing the state's broadband expansion efforts. I ask that the General Assembly appropriate up to $100 million for additional broadband expansion. That would be $300 million from the ARPA Act funds and $100 million from the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which I mentioned passed in November 2021 and that it be deployed in a manner consistent with the state's broadband infrastructure program. We intend and must reach every citizen. The Office of Resilience is more and more important. It's new to protect South Carolina's abundant natural resources. I'm proposing that the General Assembly provide the state Office of Resilience with $300 million in ARPA funds portion of these funds will be used to offset COVID-19 related increases in the cost of construction, and that's 30 percent, in the Hurricane Florence Recovery Program and to complete green infrastructure projects throughout, throughout the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. These funds will also allow the Office of Re Resilience to leverage existing federal community development block grant disaster recovery funds to reach the pre-pandemic goal of restoring approximately 500 homes which were destroyed by Hurricane Florence, as well as completing green stormwater mitigation infrastructure progress throughout the state. South Carolina's pristine coastline is a major economic driver for our state. It is roughly 2,876 miles long if you count all the bays and harbors and little inlets with approximately 200 miles of direct beachfront. The coastline contains several ecosystems including marshes, estuaries, barrier islands, tidal creeks, and beaches. The state's 35 barrier islands and the surrounding marshes are natural mechanisms for absorbing energy, flooding, and storm water, and they are beautiful. I'm recommending that a portion of these ARPA funds be used for the purpose of identifying pristine coastal properties and tracks in which public access is in jeopardy of being lost forever or lost due to flooding, erosion from st or from storm damage. I can think of no more meritorious use of taxpayer funds than to protect these pristine properties for future generations of South Carolinians. Some of you may know that in 1975, the U.S. Navy donated the World War II Essex-class aircraft carrier USS Yorktown to the state of South Carolina to become a museum ship at Patriots Point in Charleston Harbor. In 2013, the Patriots Point Authority commissioned a study by the Shaw Group to access the environmental remediation of approximately 160 gallons of petroleum and 1.6 million gallons of impacted polluted waters and polychlorinated biphenyl compounds known as PCBs that were not removed from the ship's 428 vessels or tanks and compartments by the Navy when they sent the ship to us. The study concluded it cost as much as 4.4 million for a complete remediation effort. I'm requesting the General Assembly to authorize the Office of Resilience 
to expend a portion of these $300 million in ARPA funds for the purpose of determining present-day costs associated with a complete remediation of these hazardous materials from the USS Yorktown and to execute a contract for the complete removal and remediation subject to approval from the Joint Bond Review Committee and the State Physical Affairs Authority. With the March 2021 20, opening of the new Hugh K. Leatherman Terminal in North Charleston, the Port of Charleston will no longer be the only major container port on the coast, east coast of the U.S. without significant near dock rail access. The new mar marine terminal located on the Cooper River on the former Charleston Naval Base in Charles North Charleston will be enhanced by a directly accessed intermodal container transfer facility providing near dock dual rail access that is for both Norfolk Southern and CSX railroads. The new Naval Base Intermodal Container Transfer Facility will facilitate the transfer of international cargo containers between ships, truck, and rail, allowing for the movement of goods and commerce throughout the United States. It will stimulate economic development by providing connections to key regional rail and in interstate infrastructure. And that includes our two inland ports, one in Greer, the other in Dillon, which no other state has. In addition, demand and capacity issues have created the need for a second shipping berth at the new terminal. An additional berth will allow the South Carolina Ports Authority to recruit and attract additional ocean carry services, major clients that wish to call on Charleston or locate their business in South Carolina. In 2021, the General Assembly appropriated $20 million toward the $500 million cost to complete construction of the naval facility, construct a se second shipping berth, and to conduct barge operations between the Wando Terminal and the Leatherman Terminal. My executive budget appropriates $300 million to complete destruction of this naval base and emotional facility on time and free of debt. For small businesses, <clears throat> we know that the small businesses of South Carolina, as in other places, have borne the brunt of the financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially those who are in the service and the hospitality industries. In 2020, the state directed close to a billion dollars in CARES Act funds to replenish the unemployment insurance trust fund, uh, which would have been depleted by COVID-19 related job loss claims if we had not done that. This prevented small businesses in South Carolina from having to bear an increase in the unemployment insurance tax premiums, which have not been increased in more than a decade, and we aim to keep it that way. I'm requesting that the General Assembly set aside $250 million in ARPA funds to replenish the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund just in case of a severe economic downturn in the future. You've heard about the DHEC lab. They are busy. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the DHEC, uh, DHEC conducted more than 3 million tests at its almost 50-year-old public health and environmental laboratory facility in Columbia. DHEC conducted more than 800,000 COVID-19 tests, 19, over 500, excuse me, over 50,000 screening tests for newborns. They performed almost 610,000 analyses on 36,187 samples for drinking water, wastewater, water bodies, milk, dairy, air uh, criteria, pollutants, and toxins, and there's more. According to DHEC, the average useful life of a public health laboratory is about 40 years. The current structure has exceeded that useful life and is one of the oldest in the country. Based on the increase in testing demand due to the COVID-19 pandemic and other things, the agency is concerned that the state's core health and environmental laboratory building is no longer able to meet the technological advances of modern day laboratory practices and high tech 
testing systems. So DHEC is requesting $100 million in ARPA funds be appropriated by the General Assembly for the construction of a new public health laboratory and anticipates the new facility will have a useful lifespan span of 40 years into the future or more. Public safety. To keep South Carolina safe, we must maintain a law enforcement presence and properly fund the police. I am proud to say I believe we have the finest law enforcement establishment in South Carolina of any state. Our state law enforcement agencies continue, however, to lose valuable and experienced personnel because they're unable to remain competitive with pay and benefits offered to their officers in other places. Our highways are dangerous without troopers on patrol. Every school must have a resource officer on duty all day. Fires must be battled and contained. Justice requires investigations be properly conducted and swiftly. Correctional facilities need guards and our waterways and lakes must remain navigable, clean, and safe. I don't think I left anything out. This budget dedicates $31 million in new recurring dollars to law enforcement, public safety, and first response agencies for recruitment and retention pay raises. We must also provide the necessary money to keep our law enforcement officers safe while they're on the job. The executive budget proposes providing $21 million to fund a body camera and protective vest grant program at the Department of Public Safety for local and county law enforcement agencies. We know those things work. Once again, I'm calling on the General Assembly to eliminate all state income taxes on the retirement pay of career military veterans and South Carolina law enforcement officers, firefighters, and peace officers. Many states have already done this. It's time for us to do it. The decision makers at the Department of Defense take note of such actions involving military personnel and retirees <clears throat> or the lack of those efforts as they weigh decisions on base closures, realignment, and new missions for America's military. Our state's military installations are at risk, like all others, because of this. We've had base closures here before. It's past time for the General Assembly to act on this issue. <clears throat> we are a military state. We have a military history and tradition. We have eight major military bases. They are all vital parts of our prosperity, and we must be sure that they stay that. Pay raise for state employees. Our booming economy and record low employment sometimes put state agencies at a disadvantage with the private sector when they're recruiting, recruiting employees or trying to retain those they have. Government should be run like a business and it should compete like a business too. I believe the question of state employee compensation needs reexamination. Across the board, pay raises for state employees, I believe, are less effective than those based on performance, merit, success, or longevity. Agency directors should be empowered to incentivize their personnel. This budget takes the port for, excuse me, takes the 46.6 million dollars, uh, which is equal to a to support a two percent across the board state employee pay, pay raise, and directs that those same funds be used instead for merit-based pay raises. However, each agency must submit their merit-based, excuse me, their merit-based pay raise plan to the Department of Administration Division of Human Resources for review and approval. This will help ensure that these merit raises with this money are awarded consistently across the state and are done so in accordance with official policies and procedures. Elections. It's imperative that the public have confidence in the integrity of free and fair elections in the state of South Carolina. This executive budget includes $3 million in funds for a new election integrity and compliance audit program 
at the State Election Commission. This funding will provide for the hiring of new auditors at the, at the State Election Commission to conduct regular and routine audits of elections held by the state and all political subdivisions. Ethics, to maintain the public's confidence in their elected representatives at all levels of government, we must expand the resources and authority of the State Ethics Commission and the Office of the Inspector General. Anyone who's paid to influence decisions by any county, municipal, or school board official must be required to publicly re register with the State Ethics Commission as a lobbyist, just like persons who lobby here with the state legislature. What's good for the state house is good for the courthouse. In the last decade, we have seen consistent and problematic ethical issues arise involving some of our state's 46 county sheriffs. This executive budget proposes an appropriation of $200,000 to the Law Enforcement Training Council at the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy for the purpose of developing and conducting annual ethics training for every county sheriff. Finally, <clears throat> I'm provoked, excuse me, I'm proposing that the federal ARPA funds, as well as funds from the General Appropriation Act, be appropriated for the purpose of enhancing South Carolina's economic development efforts, especially in the areas of agribusiness, motorsports, manufacturing, and research. In conclusion, if we seize this moment by thinking big, by being bold, and by making these transformative investments that I've proposed, I believe we have the opportunity now and we can set our state on a course that will provide the opportunity for prosperity, success, and happiness for generations of South Carolinians to come. So let us continue to working together. Uh, I believe in South Carolina. I believe in the people of South Carolina. And I believe in America. And I believe that the best is yet to come. With that, if I have any voice left, I'll try to answer some questions. <laughs> The, the, the difference is uh, we know that it's successful in other states. Uh, we know that it works. We know the value of our, our military uh, retirees. As you know, this is a military state. A lot of the military retirees uh, retire early enough to, to do other things, to take up second, second careers. And uh, uh, another major factor is, is this year with, with this money that's available, now is the time. They're, they're probably, with our economic growth, with the things that are happening, uh, we, we think that the next five to 10 years, that, that's about as far as we can see, are going to have phenomenal growth and prosperity for the state. And, and now, is, now is the time to make these changes to take advantage of that growth. And now is, is the time that we have a lot of money that has come to us that we can use for those purposes. Well, we, we, are, we want to put the, the money there. We're putting in more money than uh, they've been there before, about 100 million, 120 million more than, than the last, last budget. But the key to this is we are looking at it in terms of the, the, the student-teacher ratio. And that is one teacher per every 11.7 students is the way uh, ideally that it would, would break down. But the, the real key is the transparency and accountability. We mentioned that we would require the school districts to post uh, on the internet or places where people can easily access and understand the information, exactly what the money's being spent on. I think most South Carolinians want the money to be spent on teachers. Uh, they don't want the money to be spent on uh, administration costs or uh, or, or top-heavy uh, top administration 
expend it to us. They want, they want teachers in the classroom and we want the, best, the very best teachers in the classroom. And by providing the extra money, by, <clears throat> by showing that we're interested in that student-teacher ratio and that that's, the money is going to follow the students where the students go, uh, and providing that accountability, we think that, that turns the course and heads us in the right direction for stronger education. Well, in uh, conversations uh, with the lawmakers we've had, they've been very interested, very uh, determined. Uh, many have expressed the, the same things that, that I've, I've spoken of today. But, but in the end, taxpayer money ought to always be spent on important transformative things. It should not be frittered away. It shouldn't be squandered. It shouldn't be put on pet projects that don't produce results for the people. And we, we need to be very careful. That's where transparency comes in. If, if the people out there know what the, what the money is being spent on, uh, then the, the people can give their, uh, their approval or, or disapproval. But with, with these funds that are here now, uh, and, and this is a lot of money coming from the federal coffers that, of course, ultimately comes out of our pockets. We have to pay this money back. We have to be careful that we spend it on the right things. But the good news is because of the way that our people responded to the, the pandemic, we did not close, we were careful, we were measured. We are not digging out like they are in a lot of other states. So we have opportunities that they don't have. Also in the southeast, we have sunshine, we've got the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we, we got water, we got all those things. So th this is not the time to, to mess things up. This is the time to invest. And uh, that's, that's what we should be doing with the taxpayer money, every dime of it, every day. That will help put Darlington even more on the map. As you know, in the last cycle, they were the first uh, such uh, NASCAR site to open and, and have racing. Uh, many, of the, many of the vehicles, uh, many of the cars that raced were, were locked up in North Carolina in garages that were, were there. But uh, that track is historic. All the racers know it. The sports world knows it. We need to see that the traffic can get in and out of there uh, on, the, on the roads uh, more efficiently and, and safely. Uh, that is a major attraction to South Carolina, not only for race fans and, and fans of competition, but the, the technology and the insight and the, the data assimilation and all of those things, the science of it is something that's fantastic to see. And we want to, uh, we're hoping that they'll be able to, to um, make it available, those, those sorts of insights in the infield to people who want to come see it. It is a, it's probably a, a, an attraction that we have that is not nearly as well recognized as it should be. And if it is more well recognized, we think that it will uh, produce uh, a, a ripple effect across the economy. Well, if we have uh, plenty of opportunities for them, they will stay. And that is one reason that our Department of Commerce, our Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism, our um, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and everything in between is working hard to showcase uh, what we have here and make it available to, to everyone. Um, we have our, our people, our culture, our tradition over the, the centuries has developed a, 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 a great um, state. And we have many, many things that uh, we're very proud of that don't have in other, other states. But if we, have the good, if we have the work that is here for, for our people, uh, they may go off to learn or may go off to see, but they'll come back here to live and that's, that's what we want to do. But this is, that's why this is such an important time, because we, we have an opportunity to take a big step forward, big step. But we got to do it right. 
if we go off the wrong side of the bridge on this, we won't have another chance. When it comes to infrastructure, roads and bridges, if the money is approved, what is sort of the time frame to get some of these projects in completion? Some, some of it takes a long time to build a highway. It, it takes a long time to plan to build a highway. But fortunately, our Department of Transportation already has plans, and Christy Hall, Secretary of Transportation, has said that these funds will allow, allow us to speed up, to start earlier, and to speed up the construction of those, uh, of those roads and bridges. So it's, it's, it's not overnight. Of course, you don't want it to be overnight. You want it to be done right. But they, they are con with, with the, the, the situation that we're in now, there are contractors in other places uh, that are available. You have to not only have the money to pay them, but they have to be available to come here, and they are available now. So now is the time for us to take a giant step forward. Any other More? For what? No, that's, that is, uh, well, well, there are a lot of people calling for audits, but the, an audit is a good thing to have, to be able to do that. Uh, the, we, we have to have people who can go out and, and do it, but the, the goal is for all of our people to have confidence in, the, in these elections. As you know, in the last election, and there have been others in the past, uh, there been, there's been a lack of confidence uh, in our state as well as other places. If we have this kind of uh, mechanism set up, we can ensure the confidence of the people in the elections. Last question. Governor, just kind of more of a recent issue you've seen. Are you planning on using any more money to help the heck out? I know you kind of have an issue with testing right now, that backlog. Any uh, way to address that through this budget or another way? Well, they, heck, you're, you're right. There, there are a lot of lines. <clears throat> lines for testing and not any not lines for vaccines anymore you remember uh, some time ago we had long lines waiting to get vaccines we have plenty of vaccines we don't have enough tests the uh, uh, Biden administration is seeking I think 500 million more rapid tests but we have not received those yet uh, they are hard to find tests on the on the market out there which a number of the governors are going looking here and there and they, they can't find them but I would urge everyone just to, it, it, to recognize that uh, this is uh, we're in a, a little bit of a um, log jam right now but just to be patient and be careful uh, we've we've come this far uh, we've done well and we, we hope to have ample testing uh, supplies within a reasonable time, but we really don't know when we'll be getting them. But I will say, don't go to the emergency room for a test, because that's not what the emergency <laughs> rooms are set up for. Go to a testing site. And there are, I think, 320-something that are that open right now. Thank you. Thanks,